second the conversation begins, whether it's uh, homeowners that have lived here for a short time or a long time, it's like hitting an oil well and a geyser erupts, that people see so much potential in our neighborhoods. Some people from memory of the neighborhoods of 40 years ago, uh, but younger people that can see where Oswego can go. In some ways, this is a tale of two cities. One is a city perceived by outsiders and local residents alike to be an irreversible decline. A dwindling tax base, underfunded services, aging population, relatively high unemployment, combined with a fragile economic base, all painting a bleak picture of the city's future. The other is a city with impressive municipal infrastructure, unrivaled historic significance, attractive neighborhoods with well-maintained homes occupied by residents bent on reversing those negative perceptions, stabilizing the community, and moving forward in a progressive way that paints a much different and more positive image of the city's future. This is a story about Oswego, New York, but it could be about any small city in the post-industrial era. What makes this story distinctive is a grassroots effort underway by some Oswego residents to convince their neighbors that the tide can be turned. The approach is not simply an exercise in well-intentioned wishful thinking. It's based on an extensive data-driven analysis of the entire city housing stock, nearly 6,000 residential properties. A landmark study funded by the Richard S. Shinneman Foundation is providing a roadmap for change, setting a course for revitalizing city neighborhoods block by block. The stakes are high, not least the potential for restoring adequate tax revenues to city coffers from increased residential property values alone. Oswego resident Paul Stewart, head of the Oswego Renaissance Association, and Charles Buki, president of Alexandria, Virginia-based CZB LLC, a neighborhood planning consultancy, have been working with a team of city residents to gear up the implementation phase of a multi-year, multi-pronged effort to respond to sobering challenges to city neighborhoods. CZB LLC was retained to gather and analyze data in support of this effort. Later in this program, you'll hear portions of Buki's preliminary presentation to a gathering at the Lake Ontario Event and Conference Center in Oswego. But first, a look at how this effort began, who is involved, and how the project is unfolding. They spoke with WRVO's Catherine Loper, Paul Stewart. A lot of upstate New York cities, including Oswego, have some strong neighborhoods, but they also have a lot of neighborhoods that are in various states of distress. Not unusual. And we began to ask what the plan is going forward. Where are these neighborhoods going? Because Oswego has beautiful architecture, beautiful neighborhoods. It should be a place that's valued, that's loved, that matters. And it does matter, but it can be even more. And we found that looking around in other cities, other models existed for neighborhood revitalization. And we're fairly disappointed both with the status quo and also with what we were able to find. However, we found something going on in the city of Jamestown, New York, that was unlike anything we'd ever seen. They were doing something with a neighborhood revitalization firm, CCB, which Charles here is the president of, that really took a philosophy of building on strengths and gathering together private and public partners and citizens to actively reinvest in their neighborhoods, build on strengths, and in a way that was clearly working. How are you finding folks in Oswego responding to this idea even? Mm. You know, it's so funny. I moved here in 2001 into the city, and I've always been told, unless you were born here, you won't be listened to, and I have found it to be just the opposite. Longtime residents here care deeply about the city, and the city, there's no question, is worth caring about. It's an outstanding place to live. Um, it has beautiful neighborhoods. And when we talk about a middle neighborhood approach, a middle market approach, a, a, an approach based on building on strengths rather than focusing on what's wrong, most all of them I've talked to just love the idea intuitively. You know, and especially since also this approach that Charles and, and CCB have used has worked in other communities. I mean, in, they've been doing something like this in Baltimore for over a decade. And in those neighborhoods, the housing values have risen. Um, it's nice to be able to do something that's both intuitive, but that's been working in other cities. 
CCB and the community and the stakeholders involved, of which there are many, we'll be co-creating a revitalization plan to address what we need to address so that uh, we can move our neighborhood markets forward, whether that's block challenge grants in some instances, whether that's altered uh, patterns of how police work, any number of things uh, in, the, in the toolkit. And one of our jobs at the Oswego Renaissance Association is to make sure this plan is implemented. All too often, plans are made, then they sort of sit on the table. And that's not going to happen. I am very fortunate that SUNY, for example, is such a strong partner with this, that uh, this is part of uh, our community outreach, my community outreach as a faculty member at SUNY, and it's also based in the community, and we work with residents on this. And I have almost 20 years experience along with my colleagues in writing grants and and doing well with it. And so we will be uh, writing grants for funds to implement these programs, whether that's the Shinneman Foundation, John Ben Snow Foundation, but also with local uh, public and private partners, um, local banks and local businesses. This is how it's generally done. Um, Organizations, institutions that have a stake in Oswego's neighborhoods and that's our plan to move forward for the next many, many years in doing this. And uh, we are committed to doing it. I'm glad you brought up SUNY Oswego because I wanted to ask, and, and Charles, maybe you can speak to this in terms of experiences you've had in other cities that have universities in them. Obviously, it's got to be a great resource in terms of people drawing talent and cultural events and that sort of thing. But then it also brings students. And I know there's a big student rental housing market mm-hmm. here in Oswego. And I don't know if you've found in the past that those blocks are, are harder to revitalize because the students come and they go. Well, you know, one of the things that is great about students in Oswego is that when they are invested in something, they do a terrific job because there's an enormous amount of talent in our students at the college. And I think that we can capitalize on those talents in the community in ways that we haven't thought of yet or that we haven't done yet, you know. Well, just one small example, on our renovation of our home along West Park, um, many times over the years we've had students from the technology education department work with me because I'm a carpenter on the side. I mean, I mean, that's my hobby. And they are incredibly talented and creative and bright. Some of these are designers. I mean, I have images of internships with students in this program, but that could be manifold. And um, like anyone else, when students are invested in the community, uh, they can make a big difference and do. And Charles, what's been your experience? Well, there's, there's no question that communities with a rich college life either feathered into the community physically or or otherwise are at a significant competitive advantage. So we have clients, for instance, in, in Chapel Hill and in Boulder at one end of the market and in Norfolk where Old Dominion is at, at the other end and in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins, both at the medical school and the undergraduate campus. We, we certainly have a, a deep appreciation for the challenges that, that are there. There are housing implications. There's tax revenue implications from restaurants and, and retail. So it's a huge economic generator. Uh, but it, it's it's a relationship that requires a, a, a lot of management. There's no question about it. At one end of the spectrum, students become incredibly valuable from a housing point of view uh, because they buttress the rental market, uh, for starters. Often there are housing stocks that won't work for families, and students become a, just a, a fantastic option for making structures that would otherwise be obsolete uh, stay in productive use. And so that's definitely value added. I think a lot of people, when they think of revitalizing towns, they think they need to either bring in jobs or bring in the big box store or a chain restaurant or attract something like that to the community. But it sounds to me like what you're describing is is way more grassroots than that. Well, it's not an either or. I mean, you definitely have to have a coherent economic development strategy. And, and that means you're going to have to pay really close attention to your labor force, how competitive you can be with respect to your labor force. And so that on the economic development front, there's no question communities have to have short, mid-range, and long-term strategies for being able to land those jobs. So that there's no question there. But on the other side, who is there now behaving in what ways is largely what sets the table. Part of the challenge also is to not be seduced by something of a chimera of quick receipts from sales taxes from big boxes and the lure of that promise as a fill-in for a more genuine economic development strategy. On the grassroots side, you know, what you really want to pay attention to 
are the realities of your demographics. Uh, where is your population age-wise? What choices are they making uh, on a day-to-day -day basis? And what signals are those choices sending to the market? And so in the life cycle of a community, as you're shedding jobs or attracting jobs, the marketplace has choices that it's going to have and act on regularly. Should I live on the east side or the west side? Should I live in the city or in the town? Should I live not in the city or the town, but further out in the county? And so what is absolutely imperative as a companion to a coherent economic development strategy is a city making a decision collectively to compete for families who can choose to stay or who can choose to leave or who can choose to come in or choose to locate initially elsewhere. And in order to win that competition, it's absolutely critical that the same city that has its coherent economic development strategy and is focusing on being competitive for families with those choices, that that same city understands that the best down payment on that is to retain the families you've got and retain the families who could up and leave at any moment. And that the critical step prior to that is to find those families who are investing and ensure that those investments continue and grow. The signs of those investments don't have to be grandiose. They can simply be a new, new set of gutters and downspouts, new screen doors. Taking care of the exterior of the home turns out to be a tremendous confidence-setting signal to other folks on the block that it makes sense for them to do the same thing. And that turns out to be the foundation for folks deciding we're going to stay. And it's part of it focusing on positives that are resources, whether they be natural resources or economic resources or people resources. Is that part of it as well, in addition to the actual physical neighborhoods? Without question. So there's a bit of a trap here, and that is it can be very seductive to think that the brass ring or the reward, if you will, uh, lies strictly in form strictly in the architecture. And in our experience, the jewel that you're looking for is the family who, irrespective of their income and irrespective of their age and irrespective of whatever's going on in their life, somehow manages to put a pot full of geraniums out front and water them every day and mow the grass and trim the hedges and take in the trash cans and wash their car and keep their porch light on in the summer evenings so that they effectively are embracing their, their community and their neighborhood. And we find that that occurs up and down the ladder of incomes across the community, but that um, its frequency tails off on more troubled blocks. So what we're looking for, almost more than anything else, are signs of self-confidence by residents, whether they own or whether they rent, that they care enough about their home and they care enough about their block and they care enough about their community to make those small investments of time more even than money because that's where you're going to get an eventual return. And so when we talk about strengths, uh, what we're really talking about is signs of investment and signs of reinvestment by residents in themselves. But we know from a lot of different things in society that attitudinal changes are sometimes the hardest ones to make or, or take the longest. How do you go about doing that, getting people to invest psychologically in their community? Well, the currency of all of the work is, is confidence. Families have to conclude that it makes sense for them to spend an extra $75 this summer to tidy up their front porch, that it makes sense for them to go to the nursery and get a flat of pansies the first sign of spring and put them out, that it makes sense to put up the Halloween decorations and take them down sometime before the subsequent Valentine's Day. They have to conclude that it makes sense to do these things. And the best way to trigger that is to find ways for neighbors to come together and engage one another about life on their block and help one another out. And usually in these middle blocks, there's a majority of families just ready to undertake this work if given half the chance and the smallest reason to do so. And on every block, there's usually one or two families who are out front and leading the way and setting an example. And we try to, to find those examples and build off of those examples. Yeah, I wanted to chime in on that. I mean, 
there are different strategies that are used. And one of them that I often use as an example that they do in Jamestown that I think people understand is that if you looked throughout the Jamestown market, despite high heating costs, despite high taxes, the uh, average family, just the 50th percentile in income, had about, I think it was over $1,000 per year, for example, that they could afford to invest in their homes and blocks. And the problem was is that they weren't doing it. And the question is, why not? And what you found was that if you looked at the signals the neighborhoods were sending, disinvestment, unmowed grass, or, or peeling paint, these signals say people around you are disinvesting, so you don't want to invest either. I love the example of a little program they did in Jamestown that is just fun to talk about. In Jamestown, there's an organization called the Jamestown Renaissance Corporation. They put together a program they called a Block Challenge Grants, and they would say to residents, we will match you dollar for dollar for every exterior home improvement you make up to $1,000 in a summer. But the rule is that you have to get at least four other families on your block to participate, forming a cluster. And it was in 2010 or 2011 that about 29 families participated in that. And by tw the next year, 68 additional homes participated in that. And by the end of this year, it will be almost 200. Once people saw that other people were investing and staying, it was like a snowball. The, like, for example, in the 2011 case, I think they had about 54,000 in challenge grants that went out to neighborhoods. But the families themselves invested about 210,000. So all that, that, that confidence that it made sense to invest was unlocked. It's not just the money. It's getting the neighbors reinvested in their blocks. And once they start reinvesting, they have a lot of good reasons to continue to do so because your skin is back in the game. When we return, Charles Buki's report on the status of Oswego's housing market, past and present. Welcome back to Block by Block, an unfolding story about efforts to restore residential neighborhoods in Oswego, New York. Early in the process, a group of city residents, government officials, administrators from the State University of New York campus at Oswego, merchants, bankers, and other stakeholders gathered at the Lake Ontario Event and Conference Center in Oswego to hear a preliminary presentation by neighborhood revitalization expert Charles Buki and members of the Oswego Renaissance Association. Good evening, everyone. My name is Paul Stewart. I'm the director of the Oswego Renaissance Association, and thank you all for coming. Uh, tonight, Charles Buki is going to present a preliminary housing market report on the state of Oswego's housing markets. And from that report, we will be developing a revitalization plan for our neighborhoods over the next several months. The current state of the housing market in Oswego has a historical context, not unlike that of other industrial cities in the region, but with some differences, including the presence of SUNY Oswego, the largest employer in the area and a major force in the housing market. The college is a primary source of demand for rental housing in the city. Buki traced the history of the Oswego city housing market from the late 19th century to the present. I'm going to run through very quickly how we see Oswego in 25-year increments. But in 1875, your jobs are outpacing your housing, which is hurrying up to catch up to jobs. This is a critical piece. Your demand is outpacing supply. Prices are rising. Fast forward to the turn of the century. You know, your jobs are growing. The economy is growing. Housing is keeping pace, but it's still a bit behind the curve. Demand is outpacing supply. Prices are rising. Continues right up to the cusp of the Great Depression. And you are generating jobs, there's income, you're retaining the income, you're not seeing other communities that you're, in today's language, leaking your, your disposable income to. Housing is, is being built, it hasn't yet caught up, prices are stable, they're rising. You've got some trouble because given topography and given the nature of manufacturing and industrialization, Many houses that were built then were built quite poorly then, and by all reason shouldn't be habitable today. But in any case, supply is lagging on demand, prices overall are rising. You get to 1950, 
And at about 1950, now we begin to see some post-war you know, movement. We have a much more complicated economy, much more complicated mortgage finance system. Politics are very different, but by and large, we've got a supply-demand balance. Things are kind of evening out. Life is great. I mean, it is, if you're here in 1950, it is good. That moment in time before globalization really takes root in the manufacturing industry. And so balance is, a, is an important overarching theme in markets like Oswego in the 1950s. They're far from perfect. This isn't a Harriet and uh, Ozzie and Harriet, you know, overlay. But, but from an economic point of view, a lot of things are working very well. You get to 1970 and now it's not, the wheels haven't come off. But for all intents and purposes, the die has been cast. If you note the, the size of the housing market, you will see it, it has shrunk. But the thing about jobs is jobs come and go every day. Plants open up, plants hire, plants close. They send jobs elsewhere. The structure itself, it's still there. By 1970, what you begin to see is demand is now smaller than supply. It's not significantly smaller, but it's smaller than supply. And we've got a gap. And so prices, while not uniformly falling, they're rising at a slower rate than everybody else. I'm just simplifying it as a declining price structure. So it's still awesome. What's important here is the chinks in the armor are there, but policies haven't seen them, recognized them, responded to them, coped with them. There's, there is a lag, you know, it's, it's an accordion effect of policy chasing what's happening. And so lower demand is reducing prices and weakening the incentive to reinvest. I think you are slowly dismantling your beautiful city. Right? So that's, that's beginning to sort of occur in the 70s. It, it really, that's, that's a huge marker, 70 to 80. It's, it's a graveyard spiral for, for many, many industrial communities. And by the time you get to 1990, your middle class flight has accelerated. It doesn't feel like it makes, makes a lot of sense to invest in Oswego. You, you, you can, but you're taking a risk. And at that stage, now we begin to see some additional important pieces. Older stocks are becoming more expensive and less marketable, and households are beginning to age. So we've got these two other pieces that we've got to weave into this story. By 2010, you've got a bit of a life preserver that's been thrown, and that is you've got students. They're a massive life preserver for your housing market because without students, I mean, students will live in anything. I can't even believe I, I lived in anything, but they will live in anything. And often what they'll live in is simply not marketable to any other sane adult. And consequently, you're a city that if we did the math and, and discounted for SUNY Oswego, we would expect to see 650 to 750 vacant and or nearly abandoned structures. We don't see that because many of them are occupied by students. It's a double-edged sword, you know. But it net po it's a net positive any way you look at it. But from a housing market side, we begin you know, to, to soften the blow a bit. When we get to 2010, by the time we're in 2010, you're seeing in Kingsford Woods and elsewhere new construction. So we're beginning to chip away at that a little bit. So the, the supply-demand imbalance isn't quite so great, but prices are still, they're not where you want them to be. Buki went on to explain methods used to gather data on the city housing market a project that began in the summer of 2013. CZB research associate Andrea Weinberg anchored the research phase in Oswego. We looked at 5,600 structures in your city. We looked at them five times each. It's 25,000 looks. We, really without Andrea, and I'd like you to stand. We wouldn't have... Thank you. We deposited her at Paul's house for some ungodly amount of time, and she evaluated, with our guidance, um, nearly 6,000 structures. She did it by living here for six weeks, embedding herself in the community, interviewing nearly 200 families, giving us an ethnographic portrait that is just truly uh, tremendous on the qualitative side, that rounds out data without which we would not be able to give you this presentation tonight. So that's important. While Andrea did the 5,600 scores, she did it in teams, walking around all summer with groups of residents. So these scores are not Andrea's trying to scribble out what's what. It is partnership. What we did was we scored every one of your properties on a scale of one to six. At the top, your number one is best in class. Okay? That, that is best in class house. Your second is a house that needs very little, just some touch-up. You know, six Saturdays in a summer, and it's a one. All right? 
two trips to Lowe's, six Saturdays, little sweat equity, and that's your two to a one. Your three is a good, solid, middle-class uh, Oswego home, but it is tired and it needs help. A four is a troubled property, a five is blighted, and a six is abject distress. As you go down from one to six, your equity goes down, negative equity rises. By the time you get to four territory, once you get into five territory, it makes no sense to buy a piece of property. That is, that in this situation where land values are so low, you're not going to get any tax value out of it. You're not going to get any resale value out of it. So the only value you're going to get is bleeding it down to nothing and getting just cash flow rents for a while and then walking away from a tax foreclosure at some point in time. Members of the Oswego Renaissance Association, all city homeowners and volunteer team members, describe criteria used to assign houses to specific categories. I'm Rob Way. I live at 212 East 7th Street in the Oak Hill neighborhood. All right, so we scored all the houses, like, uh, like Charles had said, on a one to six basis. Um, and so the ones are in great shape. The structure looks great. The roof is uh, great. It's well painted. Uh, it's well landscaped. It's in really great shape. 8.5% of the houses in Oswego, 8.5% of the housing stock falls into the one category. So there's not that many of them out there compared to the, the rest. And you can really see that if you were to put this house on the market tomorrow, um, it has the potential, the potential uh, to sell at a, at a great price at some point in the near future. The twos also show great pride. There's just maybe two to three things that, that, that you would potentially look at to upgrade, to enhance. Maybe the trim needs to be painted. Uh, it's the stairs, perhaps, uh, in some of these need to be fixed or the landscaping needs to be spruced up. But on the whole, the owners are doing a great job and, uh, and they're showing great pride in their homes. Hi, I'm Casey Town. I live at 82 East Utica Street and I'm a proud owner of a three. But we were a four, so we're getting there. Um, the defining characteristics of a three is that there still is some major structural work to be done. Maybe you need a roof, maybe you need siding or paint. Not all of it, but one of these things maybe needs to be addressed before you would even consider listing it. A few flowers and things isn't going to push it over. You have to address some major concerns first. But what you can tell about a three is that someone lives there and someone cares. You'll see little touches you'll see that someone's making some progress, that they're not abandoning the work that needs to be done. They're maybe just not able to complete it as quickly as you would like, as is our case. And the best question when we were scoring to ask ourselves about threes and fours, which make up 50% of our housing stock, because they're kind of hard to tell apart, is a year from now, do I think that this house would look better or worse? And if you look at it and you see like the windows are washed and someone put out a flag, like you think, I think it would look better. And that's a defining quality of a three. Then you cross the line over to the fours. And a four, amazingly, can be structurally equivalent to a three. It might still need just that one roof, or maybe the porch is a little bit falling apart. But what you don't see is the same care. You might see a lawnmower on the porch, or garbage outside, overgrown things. And really, it's not the amount of money, it's the amount of effort there. And when you see a four, the easy way to define that from a three is if I look at this house a year from now, do I think it would look better or worse? And most likely, your answer would be worse. Because you see deferred maintenance, you see a habit of, eh, good enough. And that's, that's where we don't want to go. Good evening, I'm Catherine Early. My home is 320 West 3rd Street. My neighborhood is the historically significant but politically incorrectly named Pollock Hill. It's a <laughs> terrific neighborhood. <laughs> I just have to say, I just realized that Rob lives in a house that we rated a one, and Casey lives in a house that we rated a three, but it'll be a one in another year or so. Now, unfortunately, they gave me the chore of describing the fives and sixes, so I hope my not team <laughs> is not trying to send me a message. <laughs> Uh, we are fortunate that fives and sixes, which are the worst and the worst of the worst, represent a very small proportion of our homes. But that percentage does drag down the overall value of real estate in the city and the confidence level of residents who are trying to decide whether to stay here and new folks who might come to town and try to decide if they want to buy a house in Oswego City. If I were shopping for a house, it would make me very nervous to consider living next to a five. It is generally apparent that there are major things wrong with the house. 
Uh, it may have gutters coming out. It may have windows that are broken or cracked. Oftentimes the yard is full of debris, broken objects, unregistered cars, sometimes even overflowing trash or piles of items that have stayed there for years. It's obvious when you look at the house that no one cares about it. It often has no landscaping, no lawn, and no flowers. It would take a lot of time and money to bring this house up to a three status, and I wouldn't be comfortable trying to live near it. Let's do the sixes. We do unfortunately have some of these structures in the city. Every city has them, but we should try not to. These houses are either condemned currently or should be condemned. There are houses where the windows are often boarded up because the glass has long been lost. The roof may have holes in it. The foundation is often caving in, big cracks. And once in a while, you see a building that is actually tilting on the foundation as though any day now, it could cave in and turn over. It is apparent to anyone who stops and looks that it is impossible to live in these houses safely. It is generally nowadays so expensive to restore six that it makes better economic sense to raise it and replace it. While it is positive that more than 50% of our homes are threes and fours, it takes just a slight change in circumstances for a four to become a five. The incapacity of an elderly homeowner, uncaring slovenly tenants combined with a non-present landlord who doesn't see what's going on, and in just months, a slightly below average house becomes a neighborhood eyesore, bringing down the value of all the real estate surrounding it. We don't want to let any more houses in Oswego become fives and sixes. Good evening. My name is Steve Phillips. I live at 53 West Seneca Street, the former Sigma Gamma frat house. When we bought it, it was a six, for sure. Five years later, and um, hundreds of hours of sweat equity, overinvestment the likes of which we will never see the return on. <laughs> the reason why we elected to buy that house in the condition that it was in, and many of you I'm sure are familiar with the house and remember what it looked like in, in, in your mind, hopefully you, you've seen it recently and know what it looks like today. But the reason why we decided to buy that house and invest in it is because of the neighborhood it was in. The neighborhood it was in gave so much confidence because we could tell by the visible signs that people took care of their properties. We weren't afraid to invest money and time into this house. Sadly, a lot of the neighborhoods of Oswego don't project that type of confidence. When somebody is considering moving to our area, we are in Oswego competing against Radisson and Baldwinsville, Mineto, and Central Square. Our visible signs, generally speaking, are much worse than Radisson. And that's why we lose. So we've got to create visible signs that say to people moving in, this is a good place to invest. And when you've got streets that are filled with fours and fives and sixes, and they're peppered around, it doesn't present the confidence that we need for our city. In case you're unaware, there are eight resident leaders. Each one of us are building teams in each of the neighborhoods so that we can create a small army. We believe in this program. And we invite you and encourage you as, as homeowners and taxpayers of the city to join the team and join the fight and help us rebuild the confidence that this city is missing. Thank you. When we return, Charles Buki and Paul Stewart propose a strategy for revitalizing Oswego neighborhoods as Block by Block continues. Welcome back to Block by Block, an unfolding story about homeowners in the city of Oswego determined to implement a course of action that will lead to revitalization of city neighborhoods, improve the housing market, and build pride in the community. In preliminary remarks to a gathering of stakeholders, community developer Charles Buki proposed a way forward. So how do we think about this? Look at the top two, generally demand's going to outpace supply, the bottom two, Demand is going to be smaller than supply, prices are going to tend to fall, vacancy rates are going to be high, and in the middle, 
you've got price vacillation, but it's good potential, it's, it's, it's more or less stable, but there's still risk. Those are the residents you can't afford to lose. 71%, so 70-30 split, top of the market, bottom of the market in terms of quality, but then it gets a little dicey. So how did we do this? We did some, we ran some pretty complicated studies to really tease out what drives your market. So for instance, a second bath turns out to be hugely important in the Oswego market. You drop a second bath in, you're going to add, you know, north of $30,000 in resale value the minute you're done. And nobody's going to put in a bath at that cost. So you put in a bath at 12000 bucks, you get a huge rate of return. I mean, that is, it's a slam dunk. We controlled for age of structure, heating systems, square footage of the parcel, square footage of the structure, number of floors, all kinds of things. And what we basically found was this. So you have a block full of ones, and on that block, and you don't have any blocks full of all ones, all right? but few cities do. All ones, your market would be a $195,000 market. So let's just say it's a $200,000 market. If that average falls to three, you drop to $70,000. So here's an imaginary six structure block that you would find on the east side. And we've got 300, if they're all scored at a one, we've got three structures coming in at about $200,000. We start actually articulating your market the way it's shaked out over the years. We've got twos in there, some fours, a five. Now those 125 and those three structures become 70. If it's okay, that, then I, I would encourage you to stay the course. But that's what you're doing now. That's three houses that have lost $375,000 on one block. Now, it's a fictitious block, but it makes the point. It's not ficti the numbers behind it aren't fictitious. It is a hypothetical block whereby I've got all 12 houses scoring at a, at a one. So we did this all the way across. I'm not going to bore you on everything, but I'm going to go with one more example. Twos aren't at the $195,000 price point. They're at the $135,000 price point. That makes sense. But if we take a two on an all two block and just knock it down to an average of three, so it's got some drag, we've moved that 135 to $63,000. So there's the imaginary block. Those $435,000 homes have become four dollars $63,000 homes. That's $288,000 lost property value for just four properties. I've just given you $700,000 in lost property values on two blocks next to one another on the east side because we've got six or eight of other folks who aren't paying attention to maintaining their property and in some cases are being, you know, aided and abetted by habit, custom, and maybe the, the net of policies. When we roll it all together, we've got a fractal situation. This is what you've got citywide. You've got $253 million of lost market value in this city oh, when we add it all up. So what's your mill rate, Mayor? 11. 11% 11 of that, that's serious money. That's a lot of trees. That's a lot of curb and gutter. It's a lot of salt. With that kind of money, you can buy trees that are salt resistant. <laughs> that, that's serious money. It's so serious that at that level, you can actually cut your mill rate in half. You could drop your taxes. That's how come towns have such a hard time competing against the suburbs or in cities against towns and cities against the rest of the county. It's an unfair game. Spooky described frustration voiced by one longtime resident concerned about what she perceives to be encroaching blight on her block. Her comment sums it up. Our block is pretty good, but one block away, it isn't pretty. I'm telling you, she, 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 she'll grow frustrated at some point and she'll check out. If she's not 28, right, but she's 78, what's going to happen is her son-in-law in Rochester is going to get the property. And he's going to fancy himself a pretty good rental property owner. How hard could that be, right? He's going to get the property, and instead of mowing it every week, and instead of upgrading the electrical, and instead of taking care of business, he's going to hire somebody and maybe mow it three times in a summer and paint it once. And then code enforcement's going to call him, and then he'll come by and take care of it a little bit. And then eventually it'll be bled down, and it'll go from one shade of green to yellow to orange to red, in large measure because of the age of the current owner right there and the hard-to-market condition of a three-bedroom, one-house structure built in 1910 that leaks energy. The history in community development is let's fix the reds. That's the history in community development. There's not enough money in China to fix the reds. Only once in urban history has that ever worked. It was the South Bronx when Jimmy Carter was president and we put $4.9 billion into Charlotte Gardens. 
you will never see $4.9 billion into one neighborhood again. The state of California gets $2 billion from the federal government. Two, Charlotte Gardens got $5 billion. That's why it works. If you want to focus on the Reds, you need a big check. And I'm here to tell you, you don't have a big enough check. We went through, we looked at the blocks. We didn't just look at those conditions. We started to pay attention. Where are the elderly? Because you've got to pay attention to that. We looked at aging structures. Unless it's of architecturally historic significance, it's not marketable. We looked at the student impact. There's temporary buoyancy there. That market is to, it's being stitched together in a way that it wouldn't if they weren't there. Population loss matters. Your loss of population is important because it means that you've got a capacity to support about 60,000 square feet less retail space than you ought to have, even if you flatlined. It's 11 of your bookstores. It's a lot of retail space you could be supporting. When we looked at where folks were, age structure, age of house on blocks, 25 to 35% of every of the middle blocks, remember those threes and fours? That's got an elderly owner. So. If for every six structures, two of those structures are owned by somebody who might not be around in, in, in 10 years. And when we looked at that age curve, you're going to have to find somewhere 1,500 buyers pretty soon. They're there. We're going to have to think that through. Back to the buoyancy issue. Uh, our best guess on who's on campus, who's off campus, we think it backfills about 900 units a year. All right, so that's super important. But two-thirds of them are living in deteriorated structures. You know their mom's shaking their, her head when they drop them off. There's no doubt. So it's a double-edged sword. we got to think about it. what's the effect on the market there, and then what, do, what would that suggest strategy-wise for, for partnerships. You've got a, a demographic challenge here. Your red line at the top is households at poverty level. 15% isn't quite a tipping point, but it's an important line. You start creeping towards 16, 17, 18% in any market, very hard to get out of a graveyard spiral. You're sitting at north at 22% and going in the wrong direction. You've got a $65,000 to $70,000 market. You should be a ninety-five dollars to $110,000 market. So th what we would suggest is that there are some really important healthy neighborhood guidelines. You want to invest in strengths, so you're growing threes, making threes twos, making twos ones. You're paying less attention to fixing drags on the market. You have to grow resident leadership capacity, focus on outcomes. What we've given you here are baselines. It allows you to set a future target and work towards it and know whether you're making progress. Use reliable metrics, so we're, we're giving you a, a basis for measuring progress. We want you to concentrate your work where you've got scarce resources. If you've got a million dollars to spend addressing this market, we don't want that scattered over 180 blocks. We would encourage you to find the right 15 blocks, the right 20 blocks, and get a compounded return and generate visible results quickly. Finally, our axiom, the one that we encourage all clients to, to hew to, is what you measure is what you get. I can't think of anything else that's more important. What you measure is what you get. So when we look at it all, we think you've got five areas of the city where you can get a very good rate of return for your investment. And we're going to play with our understanding of those sections how to intervene in those sections, what it might cost, what we might see as a return. But here's our preliminary math. If we could upgrade 69 student homes from a four to a three, which is not huge, but not small, and 704 middle market homes from a four to a two, not fours on, on really weak blocks, fours on good blocks. If we could move those, we estimate the actual and then spillover impact would be $15 million in market value. So that's that's it. That's, that's a, it's a line in the sand. Those are numbers. You can sort of say, okay, well, that's important enough to us. How much would it cost to get that $15 million payback? Uh, of greater importance than the $15 million is a stronger civic life, owners and landlords reinvesting, seller gains, and increased pride of living and being from Oswego. I would lay those out as, as my qualitative aspirations to marry to my quantitative measures. That's how I would encourage you to begin thinking about it finally wrap it up how to do that. You're moving your threes up, you're moving your twos up, you're focusing on those middles, and, and you're doing it in partnership with residents. It's almost like the good version of peer pressure. <laughs> yeah, they're keeping up with the Joneses. You know, it was funny. I have to say something about that. I spent last year worrying and focusing on negative things, and one of the things that 
brought me around and made the healthy neighborhoods approach so attractive was it was so intuitive. Uh, my family bought a, an old rundown Queen Anne house, Victorian house in West Park. It was a derelict house. But we love historic restoration, so we restored that house. But over the next 12 months, a lot of people around that house started painting their houses, started investing. I was helping our neighbor Mike Domicolo fix his porch, and, and it just spread. It spread. So people will invest if they think it starts to make sense to do so, if others are investing, because neighborhoods are a mutual investment. Much of the framework that we will use in, in the next uh, several weeks and, and months and that will follow is strikingly simple. We're looking at quantitative data and qualitative data to give us an answer to two pretty simple questions. What's working and what's not? And it's from that that we'll encourage the community to think in a very clear-headed way as follows. Do more of what's working and stop doing what's not working. I wanted to ask you about that difficulty of getting communities to stop doing what's not working. The most difficult neighborhoods, you sort of want to, to put it very bluntly, sort of stop throwing good money after bad. How do you deal with the resistance to that? Because there are always sectors of the community who want to see resources go to those blocks in those neighborhoods. Resources should go to those blocks in those neighborhoods, but sharply articulated resources for challenges that can, for the resources available, show results. So the way we tend to look at it is on the really, really troubled blocks, our capacity to render a, a very troubled block uh, a competitive block is simply not likely with the resources available. But that doesn't mean that that block can't be stabilized. And so you have to move blocks from where they are on their economic curve to the next phase and be pretty lucid about how aspirational you can afford to be. So often what's most critical on really troubled blocks is rethinking how code enforcement is used and rethinking how scarce fire and police resources are used, thinking about zoning codes and beginning to really focus on stability as a goal as opposed to uh, a rising market. And then we can revisit those blocks in subsequent years and ask the question again, now stabilized, can we begin to move forward? So it's really not an either-or situation where no resources go in. It's resources to serve what purpose. If Oswego is like so many communities, it will find the work quite difficult to stop doing what's not working because there are always going to be vested interests in some component of the status quo. So whether it's students or whether it's some other part of community life, we're going to hope to have some sense of where the value is and where the challenges are. You certainly have to have a bigger field of vision than a project and the balance sheet of your organization and the, the pro formas for that particular project. You definitely have to be paying close attention to the market that you're in and those conditions and be very, very, very intentional about what you're trying to do. And so uh, if I may a add a point to that, what we discovered is that it's absolutely imperative to pause and ask what turns out to be a very difficult question for all of our clients to answer, which is what problem are you trying to solve? And if it turns out that the problem they're trying to solve, for want of a better phrase, is that they would like their neighborhoods to thrive and be stable, then the path to get there almost always runs through the necessity for economic diversity. And so that then tells us what we have to do with that client to get the economic diversity, to get that stability. Let me just wrap up. I want to ask both of you, starting with you, Charles, as the outside expert, when you get to a certain point in this project with Oswego, what are your hopes and, and goals here for Oswego in particular? That the community on self-reflection sees what a remarkable place this city is and has a path to strengthening its, its many existing assets and is excited, really excited, about the next phase that this city is going to go through and has clear steps to get there. Paul, as the insider, the local, what's your hope and dream for how this will end up? I don't think I could say that better than Charles just did. <laughs> I think that what I would love to see is that, number one, our neighborhoods and our people in them realize 
that we have incredible assets in Oswego and that Oswego should be valued more and is worthy of reinvestment and can be strong. There are communities that were in far worse shape than ours that have revitalized profoundly. And we are at a point, um, the, the economics has changed, yes, but we can grow this city and these neighborhoods in a way where they will become neighborhoods of choice, where they become places where people choose to move to. And what I want to see you know, 10 years down the road is people saying what the truth is, is that Oswego is a great place. The neighborhoods are fantastic. We'd like to move there. That's what I want to see. To download a podcast of this program and to find links to additional resources, visit wrvo.org slash block by block. This program was produced by WRVO Public Media. For Catherine Loper, I'm Mike Amy. Thank you for listening.